running backs are so important for fantasy success. We're going to give you our early rankings for the top 10 most important guys. A lot of risks for some of them, some changing scenery around them. We'll deep dive the top 10 running backs. Make sure you subscribe, like, and enjoy the video. Hey, this is John Taylor, running back for the Indianapolis Colts, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah! Welcome in. Tuesday, April 12th, the Fantasy Footballers back with you. Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right? Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, excited to be with you today. Early top 10 running back rankings oh, yes. show. You guys ready to fight? Always. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I live to fight, Mike. My early RB4 is sensational. <laughs> and you will not want to miss it. <laughs> um, no, I, I expect us to get into some very, very contentious friendship um, threatening uh, debates today on the show. So it'll be fun. UltimateDraftKit.com. Head over there. You can pre-order the UDK. Number one tool to get ready for your upcoming drafts. If you're into Dynasty, you can get access to the Dynasty Pass right now. That is available. UltimateDraftKit.com. Twitter at the FF Ballers. If you want to follow the show, you can watch it at YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballers. Make sure you follow us if you're listening on a podcast app. Follow the show on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, so you get notified of every early rankings episode. And the other ones, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not a follow specific for early ranking no, shows. No. Yeah. No. You're going to get regular ranking shows. Right. <laughs> late ranking shows. Right. It's oh, just, it, it's incredible. Do, we should do it way too, everyone does the way too early mock drafts. Yeah. We should do the way too late ranking shows and really. Yeah. Oh, man. Week four. Pretty accurate. <laughs> I thought you were going to say we should mock draft like 2025. Oh, no. No, Mike. No, that, Way too early. That would be silly. I'm just saying like after the yeah. season's over, if we do a ranking show, we will be really good dialing it in. Uh, Al Borland's here. Judge Giamatti, the Borgogan, all behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Al, how you doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Nice and sweaty over there? Always. Always sweaty. Borgogan, how you doing? I'm alive. We All need right. a name for the gang. Oh, for the crew? Like, yeah. is like a posse? Yeah. Cause, well, I mean, like, you know, uh, Dan Patrick has the Danettes. Oh, no. And, like, all shows, like the the lackeys. That they, are, get a, they get a title. They get a name, yeah. Because individualizing them is too much credit. So it you is. Need to just, exactly yes. right. Exactly right. It's bring just, them down. Well, bring, make them ours. Maybe the Foot Clan. <laughs> you know, the Danettes. That's, that's a pro move, Dan. It is. Like, oh. <laughs> those are... Those are like... Uh, but there's three of us. Yeah, I know. It's, so it's going to be the Jasonettes. I get it. The Jam Squad? The well, Jam Squad? The ja well, I get it. Jason, Andy, Mike. Oh. It's not good. Um, let us know, Foot yes. Clan. Give us some ideas. We, I, I think we will take some Foot Clan ideas here, yeah. and that will cement them into just a, just a group we can refer to. That way we don't have to one-on-one yeah. -on -one them. I like that. I'm sure they're big fans of this plan. Quick question of the day. How much do you factor in offensive line when ranking and drafting? We're doing the running back rankings on today's show, so it's a good question. People often ask this in the offseason. How much do you consider the offensive line? Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I, I consider it in the extremes. So, you know, if you are one of the worst in the league or one of the best in the league, they matter. But for the most part, most NFL teams are on a sliding scale between that. And I'm not – I think it would – you know, you'd have a lot of hubris to be like, well, this uh, offensive line is 3% better than that one, so they're going to have more run-blocking holes open up. I, I don't do it other than the extremes. But to give concrete examples to that, like last year Miami was known – like you went into the – 
the year going, this is one of the worst, if not the worst offensive line imaginable. That was part of what I didn't like about Gaskin. And then the big free agent acquisitions that happened uh, for the Chargers, and that really helped that offense and Eckler. And when I apply it to this year and I look at who's just the worst of the worst, that's the Steelers. I mean, garbage. Did you? I don't know if you guys know this. Do you know who they signed at offensive yes, line? Their upgrade, three-year, uh, fifteen million. Uh, you're you're gonna know the name, Andy. Mason Cole is their savior. <laughs> they also added James Daniels, though. Uh, I mean, who they gave him more money than uh, Cole? Yes, but uh, Mason Cole, if you are uninitiated, the former center for the Cardinals, right? That is yeah. right. Yeah. Who was the biggest problem? we had on the roster and now he's going to go over to a bad offensive line and let um, and fix it yeah he's going to let players come right at Mitchell Trubisky like immediately so that's going to be bad and on the flip side I look at a team that has spent a lot of money this offseason and really upgraded and that's the Cincinnati Bengals I am pro Joe Mixon this year yeah I and, and Kyle you you bring up a great point I mean continuity matters mm -hmm. with an offensive line sometimes just duration of of being able to play together as a unit it, it it does a lot for pass protection for run blocking. I definitely, I it's funny because this is all in the context of running backs, but I actually consider it pretty severely when it comes to young quarterbacks as well. Like I am fairly certain Justin Field season is going to be tremendously bad. I think the Bears' offensive line, the money that they are not spending, the rebuilding. I, I'm very worried about Justin Fields. You saw Zach Wilson last year struggle. I mean, being constantly pressured as a young quarterback. So, um, and then in, in the inverse, you saw the improvements that the Chargers made on the offensive line and what that translated to for Justin Herbert's fantasy value. So, um, but the extremes is the best prescription for the fantasy football player is when, when a team has uh, made extreme improvements or the inverse, I think that that's where you see the biggest impact. Mike, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just of, I, it can't, it, it's not everything for running backs, because Jason, your example of the Pittsburgh Steelers, their offensive line this year perhaps are terrible. Uh, last year, they were in fact terrible. They were they were not good. Didn't stop Najee Harris from volume voluming his way to being an elite fantasy player. Voluming. So yep. I like that. Just, just go <laughs> Coining new phrases, yeah. Uh, but it's not everything. But yes, it's a, it's one of the 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 variables, one of the inputs when you're thinking about rankings. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. All right, uh, if if you have been following NFL news at all uh, over the weekend, Dwayne Haskins died. Um, a traffic accident. Uh, he was hit uh, when crossing a freeway. Absolutely tragic news. Yeah. Um, kind of shocked the entire NFL world. He was 24 years old, 15th overall pick in 2019 to Washington. And uh, I guess the one thing I'll say is just the outpouring of, you know, people coming out and talking about Dwayne Haskins and just how much. Uh, he was beloved in that organization by the by the coaching staff, by teammates. Teammates. I mean, it was just uh, clear that he had made a tremendous mark on that organization, and um, it's just really sad. It's yeah, really devastatingly sad. sad. Twenty four years old is man. That's that's yeah. rough. Uh, hold your so, loved ones. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Just like the the one kind of positive. It it always takes a tragedy. Unfortunately, just us as humans. That's what we do. But like. The outpouring was the most notable thing for me, so like, let let the let your people know, man. Let if you love somebody, let them know. Yeah, don't hide, don't hide it. Your tomorrow is not assured. Yeah, uh, Melvin Gordon is in discussions with the Ravens on a potential deal. This was a rumor brought mm. up. Mm. Um, Stop that. So uh, massive implications if it happens. Stop that. Yeah, I, we we brought up a couple shows ago that with the current outlook for Dobbins and Gus Edwards, their their running back room is is great. If they're a hundred percent ready, which they don't know now, so they have to bring in another running back either in the draft or in free agency. I feel like the, the second I heard this news, I just this just screamed to me like, "Hey, Denver, 
Oh. We're oh, we're in talks. Right. Like this this was this to me was like when Leonard Fournette was going to the Patriots. It was like, "Oh yeah, look, they're bringing him in. They're 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 going to take a look. You want to lose him, Tampa?" It does I think tease out a an interesting discussion on dynasty value of young run, r- running backs. Because um there are players like J.K. Dobbins who are elevated in dynasty rankings long-term rankings simply due to age and the projected path skill set yes skills but maybe not right i mean because if melvin gordon is signed here his long-term value is completely changed forever so i i guess my point is just like we bring up, I bring up all the time, when you want to win a dynasty league, you can't just be paying attention to age and hoping players evolve. You also have to grab a few players that already have established what they're going to be and then use yeah. them in that time. Like There is a non-zero chance that Melvin Gordon is more valuable in a dynasty league than J.K. Dobbins right now. Sure. That he belongs ahead of J.K. Dobbins in terms of long-term value in a dynasty league, which sounds insane. But there's an actual chance that that happens despite the age gap because if Dobbins is coming off this injury, multiple backs, does he ever get handed the backfield back? Does he recover from the ACL in year one? Those question marks do emerge. So sometimes it's the, you know, it's the, what is it, the, Bird in hand. Bird, bird in hand. Yeah, yeah I like, was going to go bird in a bush, and I, <laughs> I knew that I was going to. It's not, two birds in a bush. Thank Andy. you for knowing what I was <laughs> talking about. Like if if Melvin signs a two year, right, with with the Baltimore Ravens, okay, now, yeah, I, I believe that would put him in line with Dobbins to be uh, on the same timeline for contract extent or, or when they expire. Now Dobbins needs a new contract. Is he going to land somewhere where he can take over? So uh, you aren't you aren't incorrect in that statement, and that's what a thing that can make rank dynasty rankings right now is, is with the running back position. It's so difficult because look at the at the draft. We know that running backs will be drafted, mm-hmm. and they're going to go to, to teams that already have established running backs on the team because the NFL says we need multiple bodies in here. They don't play the fantasy football one-back system. Uh, so it's just you, these types of uh, just landmines, they just they pop up. And you like, who expected? Oh, you know what? I think Melvin Gordon will end up on the Baltimore Ravens. And you're so or, just, or Leonard Fournette to the Bucks when he originally came over there. Right. And you could have said, oh, everybody. Um, uh, Keyshawn, Ronald, Keyshawn Vaughn. Keyshawn Vaughn and Ronald Jones. They're, they're good to go. It also speaks. ETN last year in the draft to James Robinson and right. the Jags. Assuming this conversation actually happened, right? Leverage or not, it also speaks to the potential health of J.K. Dobbins or the confidence of the team in J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards to be able to just walk back in and be the starter. They cannot do that. They cannot, they, they cannot go into training camp with just those two guys because they don't, they don't know for sure that they're healthy. So, yeah, you, you have to bring someone in. Uh, another suggestion here for the crew, the ball boys. What do we think about the ball boys? The ball boys. Ball yeah. boys. I mean, I like it because it's inherently slightly demeaning. They're not on the starting team. They're not men. They're boys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so that part is good. Well, the, like ball men. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to work. Bald men only works for one oh, of them. Oh, yeah. the bald So men. that's not going to work. We're just, you know, it's, we're still workshopping. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll keep the trying. Ball men. The ball <laughs> man. Uh Brandon Cooks <laughs> cashing in two year thirty nine million dollar extension, thirty six million in guarantees. Hope you got a no trade clause. I like Davis Mills and I like him more with Brandon Cooks still on the roster. So I was in a dynasty startup draft and Dave and it was a, a super flex and Davis Mills was so interesting to me because I actually like him. I think he's he showed more promise than most of the you know, quarterback rookies last year. And if he's good, he is super valuable. He's young, rookie, he's got he's got an upward trajectory. But the problem is this is a team that projects to at least have a top five pick. Yeah, they're the lowest win total. Right. So they so could have what, five, five and a half wins. If Davis Mills performs admirably, but they end up with the number two or number one pick and a good quarterback 
glass. Wait, if General Mills produces admirally? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, admirally. Oh. Then he's out. You know what I mean? The team's not going to be like, they're going to be like, yeah, you you did you did just fine. Thank you for your service. We're getting a franchise quarterback. Now, yeah. so long term, you know, speaking of these running backs going to Davis Mills seems very similar where there's just no, there's almost a guarantee he can't keep the job long term. He would have to get this team to be middle I of the I would bet the over on the Texans. If it were me. Well, I don't, well, what's the win total? At? I think is it, is it five, Kyle? It, on some places it's four or three and a half. Oh, yeah. I'll hmm. take that. 17 game season, Davis Mills. Hmm. Brandon Cook's back in tow. Lovey Smith and that defense playing hard with whatever they got. What it, it? I'll bet the under on the Bears and I'll bet the over on the Texans. I'll put it that way. Aren't you like listing what they had this year? Sure. <laughs> For part of the year. I mean, okay. da Davis Mills wasn't the guy from week one, right? Not week one, but... They, they still get to play the Jags twice, so <laughs> oh, an gosh. over bet is not a bad The NFL thing. hasn't banned that yet? No, it's ridiculous. No, I, I, like, I like Davis Mills. Davis Mills played most of the year. Other than the fact he has two last names, I like him. <laughs> um, you guys want to talk rankings? That's, that's just an arbitrary. Yeah, just a, yeah take that, Davis Mills. Yeah. Don't want to. It should um, be David Mills. It just throws me off. I always think Dummy. I'm saying it wrong. All right, let's talk running backs. <laughs> running backs. <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right. Uh, let's. The laughter. Oh, the ball boys. The laughter's the for ball the YouTube boys. group. Uh,. The what? <laughs> the, you, I, I was going YouTube crew, yeah, you but were, I'm pretty sure I put a B on that. <laughs> it's a hot one tonight. Oh, boy. Early running back rankings, our early top 10 consensus rankings we all went through and put together our initial lists, put them together, and here you go. Half PPR, that's how we are uh, breaking it down. Going to get through the top 10 today. If you want to see some... Big time deep dives on these players. You can go back to the truth episodes early in the offseason as well. And obviously, rookies are not included in these rankings because we don't have destinations for any of the rookies. But numero uno, not a surprise, number one on all of our boards, Jonathan Taylor, the 23 year old force who's going to be the number one pick in the majority of all fantasy drafts. He had 11 RB1 performances in a row from weeks four through 15. <laughs> That's uh, outrageous. If you go back to Christian McCaffrey's superstar 2019 year, he had a stretch of nine straight. So Taylor surpassed that, surpassed Gurley's 10 straight in 2018. It's kind of incredible. He he only averaged 15.6 carries a game for the first nine weeks. Week 10 on, 24.4 a game. Matt Ryan coming in. Really, the question is how can anything go wrong for Jonathan Taylor this year? If we think Matt Ryan is at worst a neutral change at quarterback. I mean, injury, that's how it that's how it goes wrong and and he's a young guy who's got a body that could take a workload. He so there so you're you're not going to you're not going to speak on the negatives here. Uh, there are negatives to the next two guys, but there's a reason why Jonathan Taylor is the consensus one on one. He's young. The way that they ended up utilizing him the second half of the year shows like they figured out what a superstar he is. And if they utilize him that way, give him 20 carries a game the entire season, which is very reasonable, uh, he should be the, the running back one on the season. Um, you know, he's he can catch the ball. He's the goal line back. He, he's unbelievable. He introduced our show today. It's just there's nothing yeah. not to love about this guy. 1,811 yards, 18 rushing touchdowns. The the way it goes wrong, look, the only way I can see is if Matt Ryan is worse this year than than last year, like if he's just completely washed. Uh, but I don't think that that is the case. Uh, so I think that if Matt Ryan – and like let's say Matt Ryan just really can't get anything done, does he end up checking it down to Jonathan Taylor more and – in the production profile of Matt Ryan of the history, he throws to the running back far more often than uh, uh, than Carson Wentz has in his career. So I think that it's there's really nothing to be scared of for Jonathan Taylor at the one hundred one. Yeah, the first the going into week four of this previous season, Jonathan Taylor was the running back twenty nine. They were not utilizing him 
the right way. And then once they figured out, like, this dude is beyond special, he's the Hulk. they're not changing it. He is the center of this offense. Could they and, have been overutilizing Carson Wentz? Yes. Well, yeah, because he was behind center. <laughs> so they were. <laughs> okay. No, I get it. He touched the ball on, like, every play. Yeah. So. Which well, was I mean, starting in – that's starting from a negative position. Right. If Carson Wentz begins the yes, play with the ball. Right. Yes, exactly. Real big fans of Carson Wentz here in the studio. Uh, number two, Christian McCaffrey. He's actually number two for all three of us. I don't think that that will be a guarantee across fantasy football. Uh, there are so many people who are burnt – to a crisp yes. with what they've experienced with Christian McCaffrey over the last two years. He has been injured. I mean, it, this has been the story of Christian McCaffrey has been you hope you get what you had in 2019 and you don't. So when he's played, he's been elite. Ten total games in the last two years, though, that's not a lot of games. When he played, he was top five seven of those ten times. He's so good. So, And this was with different quarterbacks in different situations. He is a difference maker when he's on the field. He is a positional advantage. But I think a lot of folks are going to take the approach of, I'd rather not be burnt again. And so I might roll a different option at running back, which could mean that McCaffrey drops in some leagues. But should he? I mean, no. I, I don't blame people for wanting to avoid the burns because, you know, Part of fantasy football. That'd be triple burns. Yes. And well, like I'm sure Christian McCaffrey spread that love out because being the, the first overall pick two years in a row and getting multiple different fantasy football managers. But in, in healthy games last year, he averaged seven receptions and sixty six receiving yards. In four of his five healthy games, he was a top five running back, and that included in two of those he didn't even score a touchdown. The guy was the running back one in week one without a touchdown. That's how absurd his production can be. And it's the Panthers are going to try to have it not be Sam Darnold, but it's going to be Sam Darnold at least for uh, the first portion of the year. I mean, hey, it, Sam Darnold was 3 yes, 0 with Christian McCaffrey. Sam Darnold throws the ball to Christian McCaffrey, and like. He, he, he he barely played, and he finished as the running back thirty nine. Like at the in the end of season rankings, he finished barely behind Chuba Hubbard, the guy who played essentially the whole season for the Carolina Panthers. And in just five healthy games, Christian McCaffrey was right behind him. You can look at him as a risk, but I like almost the injury risk of of running backs in the first round is is gigantic for all of those players. But very few of those players can actually do what Christian McCaffrey can do when he's on the field. Yeah, the, the thing is, is when you look at the next few players you're going to be willing to draft, there are big worries and question marks with all of them. There's none with Jonathan Taylor, and then you get to uh, – everybody else kind of has some little strike against them. Uh, the next player that you know is was better than Jonathan Taylor last year, was unbelievably dominant, is Derrick Henry – who we all have number three as well. So this the, we haven't changed in our personal rankings that we did this independent of one another. We all had uh, it go Jonathan Taylor, CMC, Derrick Henry. But obviously Derrick Henry has his own issues. He's uh, coming off, what was that, Jones? Uh, yes, the Jones fracture. The Jones fracture in the foot. And, you know, he's older than McCaffrey. So there's no guarantee there. So this is why when, I, when Jonathan Taylor's off the board, I'm going Christian McCaffrey because everyone has risk. And his ceiling is is the highest. Yeah, I think uh, for things to go wrong outside of a recurring injury, the team should appropriately try to spread his workload around. Now, that's, I mean, they shouldn't have Sam Darnold at quarterback, but they did. So who's to say that they don't try to run him into the ground? He has the most guaranteed money coming his way over the next two years. That's why there were trade rumors around Christian McCaffrey. Uh, if the I don't know if the team could potentially – plan to move on from him in the offseason next year so then they try to draft somebody to be the next man up Maybe. but it I, seems unlikely i think they they just restructured him a little bit ago so they they did some of the passing the buck forward of you're more you're even more committed to him i don't know how nfl teams do wild stuff with their salary cap but i don't know how the panthers can move on from him in, in the next two years 
All right, let me press the pause button real quick, and then we'll get into Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry, the man, the myth, the legend. The Yeti. Just unconscionably dominant when he played last year. He was the uh, the highest odds of winning your week was when you had Derrick Henry as one of your starters. He didn't even get to the winter. I know. He I didn't mean, get I, to transform. I can't imagine <laughs> what kind of monstrosity he would have been in the cold weather. When the snow started falling. He was so good. You cannot forget. It's so, it's so easy to forget how dominant he was because he wasn't around the, the entire second half of the year. Jonathan Taylor's all the rage, but goodness gracious. Running back 1, 11, 4, 1, 1, 12. All top 12s and three running back one overall finishes within a six-week stretch. He had seven healthy weeks, still finished third in evaded tackles. That's He missed 10 weeks and finished third in evaded tackles, 10th in carries. He was still an RB1 points-wise until week 16. And, yeah, if you if you faced him, you were terrified. Should we really call another player bouncing off of you an evaded tackle? <laughs> right. Yeah, I've, it's just... He's not evading anything. No, he's, he's, he's just powering through. I think it was Warren Sharp that tweeted out. He got me on a rabbit hole of searching Derrick Henry high school videos oh right. yeah those are the best uh, but did, did did you look at it not for those other children jason <laughs> no, he, he was the same size as he is now <laughs> and do you know how many touchdowns he had in his senior season mike are you aware uh, of this i've I, i've heard the <laughs> i didn't realize it was that but or didn't remember i've seen them from 55 time to time. Five touchdowns he had a game where he was like 468 yards and six touchdowns but how it was not child fair. tackle that man I it's mean, not fair you would not that is that's not a business decision for a high school safety. That's a that's a life decision. <laughs> for the well meaning of my future, I am I am going to let Derek Henry go. Yeah. If you you have it's to check your it. assisted suicide laws in your state yes. because that's what that decision it would is. be. I, I think that people got in trouble in high school because you know, like when you watch a train, you don't yes. realize it's moving that fast. Right. Because of its size. I think they're like, I got this. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, no, he's so fast. Well, here's what's important. Derrick Henry, will he be the same? Uh, Matthew Betts, our injury expert, breaking down the injury, the Jones fracture. Uh, it occurred in week eight. He did return, if you remember, mm -hmm. in the AFC Divisional round against Cincinnati 11 weeks later. Wasn't great. Wasn't great, but it was great that he was able to sit out 11 weeks. Yes. That was awesome. And then get an entire offseason of rest. And one of the questions about Jones fracture injuries... Hibernation. <laughs> is that what he does? Because he's a Yeti. Because um, the Yetis hibernate? Oh, I absolutely. Did, did, you, say, have you ever uh, seen a Yeti in the summer? <laughs> so they hibernate no. during the summer. They really, so they do the inverse bear hibernation. They right. really only exist where it's always winter, though. Yeah. So, like Siberia. Yeah. When the Himalayans. Ah. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so no... I, I, to be clear, no hibernation for a Yeti? Or is there I'm hibernation? They would. Hibernation. They would yeah. if it like was... Like a month? Yeah, maybe, sure. maybe it gets, gets a little warm. warm for All right, Whoa. listen. Refracture rates drop from 20% to 10% on Jones fractures when the athlete waits at least 10 weeks to return to play. So he came back 11 weeks later, so that amount of time in between the injury does reduce his risk of re-injury. Plus the full offseason. Right. So um, it's still going to be – look, you're 28.3 years old right now. Foot injury, the age, the workload – he as as fun as it is to pretend he's immortal and impossible to hurt. You he did get hurt last year. I mean, this was, you finally saw an injury. He broke, and it's not as simple as ah, he turned twenty eight and so he broke. It's just something that happens with workload. You've had running back after running back after running back. When you pile up the touches, you're piling those odds against you. Do you guys realize his pace? Like, because so. Derrick Henry, which was it was already a bit of a concern. He was coming off of multiple seasons of 300 plus carries, 303 in 2019, 378 in 2020. I do know his pace. And this past year, he was on pace for 17 games, 465 carries and 507 opportunities. I mean, that he was catching the ball. He was on almost yeah. 40 reception pace. That is running a dude into the ground. 
or and other dudes into the ground when <laughs> sure. I mean with him. Course. Yeah, I, it's it, again he's an outlier. We but, say that over and yeah, over again. But that's this, the concern. That the concern with Derrick Henry is time will catch him, and when it actually does, I, I think it will be swift. Yeah, oh. and and the time could have caught up. So this is a decision you're going to have to make. I am I am betting on him being healthy this year. Um, he's you know at at 28 he is not past that. 31 year old like death knell to running backs there are certain running backs like you want them early you want them first contract 24 years old is when I like my running backs but there are the great ones who have a long career play till the they hit that like 31 year age mark and uh, clearly Derrick Henry is one of the great ones so I'm in on Derrick Henry I'm not too worried about the injury this year it feels like their window is right now this year, like if, if things go, they were the number one seed. I want to give them credit. They were incredible, even without Derrick Henry, piecing wins together. But if it doesn't go well this year, if they regress, you've got a almost 30 year old running back and you have a fatigue with Ryan Tannehill that already led to rumors this past off season. So longevity is not what I'm looking at here with these this Titans team. I'm looking at a run to the Super Bowl this year. There have been rumors of them being kind of a surprising team to take one of the top running backs in the draft. Kind of put the it makes sense. the weaponry you know in the holster where you're you're basically what happened with Derrick Henry, right? He didn't play the first two and a half years because he was behind Demarco Murray. You know if they draft Brees Hall, ugh, I mean good long term, <laughs> but like. He's just a backup. He won't be your first pick in that situation. Austin Eckler comes in at number four. Mike and I have him at four, Jason at five. Uh, we had him on the show last year. It was a filthy liar he, right he, to our faces. He, he just hinted that maybe touchdowns wouldn't be a big part of his game. And Eckler. He went up and got 20 of them. Oh, man. 12 on the ground, eight through the air, 94 targets, 70 receptions, 911 yards on the ground. Missed a week due to injury. So um, he, he had 12 rushing touchdowns that is this right. past year. That is correct. His career heading into this season? Last he, season? or the, Yeah, so yeah. he got 12 this year, but before that, just in his career total, nine. Nine <laughs> rushing touchdowns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Melvin Gordon there for a while. I mean, it, it. it's great to be part of a great offense. It's great to have received a, a massively upgraded offensive line. Uh, things worked out very well for Austin Eckler, and he yes. was able to stay healthy even though he – it seemed like he was injured 20 times through the year, but he played through it. He did a great job. The reason I have him five and not four like you guys is the touchdown outlandishness. Uh, eight you know, receiving touchdowns is a lot. Both of those, 12 rushing touchdowns for Austin Eckler and eight receiving touchdowns. You know, if you said – how many touchdowns should he have next year? I'd say he should have 10 touchdowns. That's a good number. 10, 11 touchdowns. But nice that and is, round. Yeah. That's, um, that, I don't, that's going to yeah. – whenever we look, like it's one of those things where going into the season, you always assume that what happened last year and how it happened and that they repeat, and then you go back, look year over year over year at these touchdown – these great touchdown players – like the the you know the next player we're talking about is Dalvin Cook, who's a touchdown machine. Except, I do think that except that, last year, yeah, I think the eight uh, the receiving touchdowns are more predictable to me for him because if you're looking at Justin Herbert and you're going to get forty touchdowns out of Herbert, it's just not going to happen without eight to ten from Austin Eckler in the passing game. And when you get ninety targets, right? You say Justin Herbert, you've got one of your receivers gets ninety targets from you on the course of the year. I I don't think that that's outlandish. He had eight touchdowns in the receiving game two years ago before he missed six games the next year. But the rushing touchdowns, I think those can come down. That's certainly. funny because I think the complete inverse of that, where you're looking at the depth chart of, you know, currently we have uh, Larry Roundtree and Joshua Kelly are the other two running backs on the Chargers depth chart. So, yes, I mean, Austin Eckler proved himself as the goal line back. I would think he retains that, although the – I think the Chargers are a team to watch in the draft of one of the higher pro. Maybe Isaiah Spiller falls in the draft and ends up going to the Chargers and people get really mad about it. Like That's something that could happen. But for now, I think Eckler is safer as the goal line back where receiving touchdowns, it's it's not like it's not out of control for, for his, his skill set, his, his quarterback, 
and the volume for him to end up at the eight touchdowns, just historically, it's running backs hitting that number and then sustaining that level of production is is not what we see. Well, and they, they've been rumored to, I mean, a lot of mock drafts have them taking a top tier wide receiver in the first round. So adding to and that, 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 adding to too, that yeah. repertoire. So that would hurt. Um, big workload last year. Incredibly, all 20 of his touchdowns came inside the red zone. So it was more than just 20 touchdowns. It was 20 touchdowns when they were trying to score on that play. You know, that he was part of the game plan is what I'm saying inside the 20. Um, and you brought up the competition. Not a lot of it. Dalvin Cook comes in at five. Jason, you have him at four. Mike and I at five. Uh, despite only playing 13 games, he had the fifth most carries in football, Twenty or second most 15-plus yard runs. Yeah, I mean, he's really, really good. We, we know that he's been a top running back for the last several years. When I looked at these two guys who I love both of them, it's just a matter. It really came down to touchdowns because Dalvin Cook's a guy who's had 16 touchdowns, 13 touchdowns on the ground, and then this last year just kind of it didn't happen. Uh, what did he have, uh, six touchdowns, I believe? Yeah, this? it was just – Six rushing touchdowns this year. So I, I think that he's a guy who is uh, in line for double digits. They also got an offensive guy in there at head coach. So I think that this is a, an offense that's going to look to open things up. And Dalvin Cook is a special player. So I, I love both these guys. If I had to bet who has more touchdowns despite what happened this last year, my bet would be more on the Cook side. Two years ago, Dalvin Cook had 31 carries inside the 10. That turned into 11 touchdowns. In 2020, it was 35 carries that turned into 12. He had 26 carries, so not terrifi not terribly off of the 31. Four rushing touchdowns inside the 10. Uh, so you had a – that's where you expect the positive regression for Dalvin Cook. My red flag for Dalvin Cook uh, is, is just is the change of the coaching staff. I, he, yes, he's an offensive mind there, but what system – like are we going to see – the Zimmer you know, system of this offense runs through Dalvin Cook, or does Alexander Madison get more play? Who was out, Madison was pretty successful last year in his uh, in the couple games where he received the opportunity. So the 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 timeshare numbers getting closer together that's my my biggest concern for Cook. He's never played a full season. He missed four different times last year due to ankle, twice shoulder. COVID, uh, five seasons in the league, never played a full year. So you're going to miss games with Dalvin Cook. That's just built into what happens as well. J uh, Javante Williams comes in at number six on our consensus top ten running back rankings. Jason and Mike have him at seven. I've got him at six. Uh, I am more than happy to change this take if the Broncos either bring back Melvin Gordon or – draft a top tier committee running back which could absolutely happen uh if gordon leaves i would not be shocked if they i think they liked what they had in the committee and being able to play players off each other he would be the lead of that committee and would be very 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 good 22 years old um you know last year you saw the talent more than you saw the results in fantasy football so um you you only had Three weeks inside the top 10 last year, sharing time. But 1,200 yards from scrimmage, 50-plus targets, that's a great sign as a rookie. He, if, you didn't, if you didn't pay attention to Javante Williams last year because he wasn't the starter for this team, he was out freaking standing. He was so good. He was dominant on every touch. He moved piles. He broke tackles. And if he gets the workload, he will be – a sensational fantasy star. So uh, I, I I know, Andy, you tweeted, if you knew that Melvin Gordon was gone, he could be as high as your running back four. That is not outlandish. That is, if he has the job to himself, he's going to be a special player. You know, it's like Jonathan Taylor coming into last year. You knew that there was this young, hyper-talented guy. You just weren't sure, are they going to use him the right way, give him the opportunities, his talent won out. That'll happen with Javante Williams. Uh, the it's funny the, the the concern for me is is Nathaniel Hackett who's he's now their head coach he's coming down from Green Bay he was the offensive coordinator coordinator up there for multiple years and the biggest gripe throughout the fantasy football history of Aaron Jones is free Aaron Jones give him more touches we we want him to be a true bell cow 
dominant for fantasy football uh, in the in the limited amount of or you know in the in the time show that Aaron Jones was in. But if that's like if that's the system that Hackett is bringing down, and I have no reason to doubt that that's the system that he's going to bring down. Javante will be in a bit of a timeshare, but I have a reason. Why is that? Aaron Jones is a 205 pound back. He's like an Alvin Kamara. These aren't guys that you're going to look at as a coaching staff and be like, we should give this guy the ball 300 times versus a 220 pound Javante who, you know, Aaron Jones came into the league kind of projected to be a timeshare type of back. Javante, I think is built for a three down workload. So it could be the system. You're right. I mean, it's, it's worth bringing up that red flag, but I think that that is when you have A.J. Dillon on the roster and you have a 205-pound Aaron Jones, uh, I'm going to mix up. It was also it was Jamal, Jamal Williams. Williams, too. It wasn't just A.J. Dillon. It was they committed to that two running back system. I mean, that, That's that, why I think they could draft somebody. That hasn't stopped me from putting Javante at seven. I mean, I think he's he's an incredible player of uh, like his ability to evade tackles and things like that is elite. So... I think he'll still be great, but just you know, trying to yeah, just, just save both the other side. Yeah, and, and obviously Russell Wilson arriving and opportunities to score the football That's a is going huge to deal. be very good for him. Alvin Kamara comes in at seven, Jason at six, I have him at seven, Mike at eight. Alvin Kamara last year, two hundred forty carries, eight hundred ninety eight yards, just four touchdowns on the ground, five through the air on forty seven receptions. Uh, spent a lot of time off the field last year, missed weeks ten through thirteen. Did average 22 touches per game the most of his career, and it really, you know, it shows you that it's efficiency. That's his game. And when the offense was successful, he was very, very efficient. So it wasn't about touches per game and never has been for Alvin Kamara. It's been about touchdowns, red zone opportunities, and, um, you know, his whole career, he averaged a touchdown every 11.7 carries. Last year, it was every 60 carries. So, yeah, maybe there's some positive regression there, but I think it has a lot to do with... Drew Brees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was that a Drew Brees sneeze? Yes, that was... Oh, excuse it was me. a Drew I, sneeze. I was just looking at the sun. Yeah, a Drew was, sneeze. <laughs> yeah, it's right yeah, there. Yeah. But you have to have a better offense in New Orleans for Alvin Kamara to deliver on... Uh, deliver what he's given fantasy players in years past. So the Saints have made a trade this offseason to acquire another first-round draft pick this year and there's questions on to what their line of thinking is. It's one of two things. It's either they're getting more capital to move up in the draft, to draft the quarterback of their future. That's one option. And I don't think that that's what they're doing. We'll find out in less than a month. I think that they are in it to win it now. They've got a great defense. They've got a division that outside of Tom Brady is like, we can win a lot of games here. We can get to the playoffs, but they they know they need a couple more offensive pieces. So with the extra first-round draft pick, if they draft a high-end wide receiver, they get Michael Thomas back, Winston is there, and they already signed Andy Dalton as like the backup. So that would be so much capital to put into the quarterback if they're – uh, really looking at quarterback, this could be an offense that is much improved from last year, not back to the Drew Brees, Sean Payton, epic Saints offense. But I do think that this is a team that going into this season could could have far more scoring opportunities than they did last year with, uh, you know, the the round robin at quarterback and no offensive weapons outside of Kamara. What I liked to see was the five and a half targets – Per game, that's what he averaged with Jameis, and you know you would expect that Jameis is the starting quarterback for this team, and that includes a, a game where in week four somehow Alvin Kamara had zero targets, but that was followed up with an overcorrection of eight and then eleven. So I think the just learning process for Jameis in New Orleans of you need to make sure that you are targeting Alvin Kamara a good amount uh, every single game. So I, the the receptions seem like they will be safe, uh, which is – that's a massive part of Kamara's value. Najee Harris comes in at number eight. Last year, incredibly huge workload, 307 carries, 1,200 yards, seven rushing touchdowns, 74 receptions for just 467 yards on those 74, three touchdowns. Um, I have him – he's our consensus eight. Mike has him at six. Jason at nine. I have him at ten. Um, yeah, boo. I am. I'm just simply not confident in 
the offense and the opportunities in the most brutal division in football. Uh, he had the second lowest yards per carry ever among rookie running backs with 1,200 plus rushing yards. Uh, so it was it was volume. It really was volume for Najee Harris. And so I just don't know with Big Ben's noodle arm being removed from the equation whether or not he's going to receive the target totals. Um, that That's 100% what it is for me. You've got a bad offensive line without your Hall of Fame quarterback. If Trubisky is there, is he really going to – is he going to look to scramble a little bit or look to just check it down over and over and over? That's where Najee – 74 receptions, 90-plus targets – if that goes away, if that goes down to sixty targets and you know forty five receptions, well, yeah, he's still really involved. He's going to be good for fantasy, but he's not going to be what he was last year. I think that the offense is going to take a a step back, and so I love Najee. I mean, talent wise, he was one of my favorite prospects to watch. But uh, I'm scared about I'm scared about this offense. I'm, I you know when we get to wide receivers, I know I'm lower on Deontay. I'm just lower on on the Steelers. It is a bad division. It's not AFC West. They take umbrage with what you said, but um, uh, I I do think that it is a tough division, and that scares me off. Najee. He had the second most rushing attempts. He had the most targets in reception, or I believe tied with in receptions at the running back position. Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon were the running backs closest in rushing attempts. Jonathan Taylor had 18 rushing touchdown touchdowns. Mixon had 13. Najee had seven. Now, maybe the offense is lateral or gets worse. I think that the Steelers have been without their Hall of Fame quarterback for multiple years. He's been on the field, but he has not been very good. And if Trubisky can be just keep a few more drives alive and, and, and up that scoring just slightly, then Najee Harris is safe. And you know... What he's we very do safe know. regardless. Like he's the highest. He's a super high floor yes, volume player. Agreed. That's that's exactly what I was going to say. But I, I think he's good, not great. Is Mike Tomlin that like that's just this is the system. Mike Tomlin is one of the few coaches who who wants one running back doing everything, and we've now seen that over the course of multiple running backs. So the the volume will be there. It will be. It would if he ends up at three point nine yards per carry again. That's going to suck. Like that will it will. Suck to watch him struggle like that, but he will volume his way into being a very safe floor play with. Totally. And I still believe in the skill of Najee that if they – we can make fun of the Mason Cole edition, but you know they've, they're they trying to address the offensive line. And if, if that unit plays just a little bit better, you could see – I think you could see more production from Najee where the volume is the same. I just don't have that level of confidence that Mitch Trubisky represents an upgrade on the offensive side of the football. Oh, I, I have confidence that it does not. Um, I, I, I mean, I agree with you that Big Ben, they lost their Hall of Fame quarterback a, a while ago, but the Saints lost their Hall of Fame version of Drew Brees a while ago too. The last couple of years was a dink and dunk, constantly injured, and then you still saw the drop off to this past season. The uh, last two names that we'll mention this morning, Joe Mixon and James Conner, you can put them in whatever order you want for 9-10 because they came in tied for us uh, in our consensus rankings. Jason has Joe Mixon 8, I have him at 11, Mike at 12, and for James Conner, I have him at 9, Mike at 10, Jason has him at 12. Right now, I mean, Joe Mixon last year, availability was a big part of the equation for him. He had spike weeks. He had disappointing weeks, uh, but he played all the weeks, and that was huge in his fantasy finish. Still just 25.7 years old. Defenses have to account for T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and uh, look, Joe Mixon's a, a talent. He really is. It's 13 rushing touchdowns last year, 1,200 rushing yards, 42 receptions, I think it was pretty clear last year he was not going to be on the field on third down all the time. Right. And they're not going to move to a new system of him doing that when they reach the Super Bowl with this system. So, well, when you have the chance to give P Ryan the ball, you got to get it. <laughs> you got to get P Ryan the ball in space. <laughs> yeah. So, Mixon is not going to go and jump up to 70 receptions or be one of those type of players, but 
Um, improvements on the offensive line, right? Um, yeah. Collins they, uh, came in this offseason. And so, you know, the schedule gets tougher. Per Warren Sharp, jumps from the third easiest last year to the seventh hardest at that Super Bowl hangover. Mm-hmm. So, the offensive line will I like, help. I like him in, you know, 11. Yeah. I, I like him where I've got him at eight. Yeah. So uh, they they got Alex Kappa from – Tampa Bay and Lyle Collins from Dallas. So their offensive line is going to be better. I agree with you. This isn't going to be a guy that's going to be a 70 reception back. But the offense, to me, has just the arrow pointed up with Joe Burrow. Uh, what what happened towards the end of the season, Joe Burrow catching fire, them taking the Super Bowl run. I mean, we'll see what the Super Bowl hangover does to this young team. But they have really improved the roster. And if Joe Burrow just takes the – expected continual steps forward in his career this is an offense that should be putting up tons of points um I think you want pieces on it and if he ends up you know if you say okay what running back has the chance for 15 rushing touchdowns he's one of the very few that could really be up at a massive uh you know s scoring threshold and and so that's why it's more team-based here and obviously he's super talented you you know he's been someone that's always his issue's been staying on the field, I think. But when he's been on the field, he's he's been productive. Win total for uh, Cincinnati is at seven and a half. What? What? Sorry, I thought we're that's at all. nine nine and a half. Nine, nine and, and a half. half. Okay, okay. that sounds that makes more sense. more sense. That would be some the disrespect. <laughs> no, I mean it's going to be tough. It really is. It's going to be tough for them to um, the question. Co combat. For, I don't disagree with you, Jason. Of like the of, of teams that when you're you know looking at the ceiling and the floor, the Bengals have a ceiling that uh, they may not have hit last year. Sure. But they were still seventh in points per game, you know, tied for seventh. So, like, how much higher can they actually go? 16 total touchdowns was his career high by a lot. So, it, it, in the range of outcomes, Mixon's one of those players that could surprise, but a lot of things would have to shake out right for him. James Conner last year, 15 rushing touchdowns, three through the air, got the new contract this offseason. Chase Edmonds departs from Arizona and everybody's kind of scratching their head with James Conner because you had kind of uh, all but fantasy buried him in terms of a top tier option. This wouldn't have been a strange place to have him ranked in Pittsburgh a couple of seasons ago before we felt like, and, and maybe that had a lot to do with that offensive line in Pittsburgh being atrocious, but James Conner had seemed like his better days were behind him. Then he shows up last year and delivers 18 total touchdowns, a great fantasy finish, a difference-making week-to-week for fantasy players, and ends up the running back five. I mean, he was he was the running. That's his highest fantasy finish ever. So even in the year where he kind of stepped up, stepped in for Lev Bell and delivered those uh, profound totals, he finished at RB six that year. Then dipped to 33, then 26, then last year at RB five and you know, doesn't have competition from Chase Edmonds. The Cardinals are missing some draft picks in this draft. I don't expect them to invest one at running back, me personally. I think that they're more likely to sign a Daryl Williams in, in free agency than to draft somebody, and that would be a depth piece. So in a single-season vacuum, doesn't it seem like Connor has this entire role on lockdown? It does, and he should dominate with it. I mean, you saw him dominate last year when you're the running back five. That's great. But Connor had five games without Chase Edmonds. His opportunities went up. His targets went up, and he changed from 13 fantasy points a game to 20 fantasy points per game. This is an offense that projects to be extremely high-powered with Kyler Murray and Hopkins and um, Cliff Kingsbury You know, trying to push the tempo. So the, all things you love. Um, I do worry about, you know, his injury history. He's never played a full season. And if he gets all the work, he's there. But he's he's a tough player. I, I love James Conner. I don't, you know, I liked where I had Joe Mixon at eight. I don't like that I've got James Conner at 12. It's kind of some pessimism of, well, they've got to bring in another player and he's got a bad injury history. So I'm kind of hedging. But if he's on the field, for this offense, he should be scoring touchdowns, and they use him in the passing game. He's he's a really well-rounded back who looked great last year. Connor had 15 red zone touchdowns. Over the last decade, 43 different running backs had double-digit red zone rushing touchdowns. 
Only five of those 43 repeated them the following year. Yeah, so it's, it, it is very hard to repeat, but looking back at the the system that Kingsbury has been utilizing here, like when they traded for Kenyon Drake uh, a few years ago, Kenyon Drake was seeing, you know, a, at least one carry inside the five per game. The next year where Kenyon Drake uh, had a bunch of touchdowns in, you know, in 2020, he had, uh, pull up the number, he had, so he had 10 rushing touchdowns that year. He was averaging about 1.3 carries inside the five. James Conner, that's right along his average as well. So there, there wasn't like an outrageous jump uh, in volume this particular year for Connor compared to the the way that Kingsbury has let his his primary goal line running back go. So the, the opportunities are going to be there, and Kingsbury's favorite play oh, when yeah. he gets to the goal line is run it up the middle. Do you know the snap percentage for James Connor through the first eight weeks? I'm going to guess it was not high. I'm going to guess... 40%? 40 percent, 42% for the first eight weeks of the season, and into after that it jumped up to seventy five percent of the snaps. So he was he was still the goal line guy at the beginning. It was the receiving yep. work that took him to the next level. Yeah, his his touchdown pace at forty two percent snap count was seventeen, which will be so, interesting if they sign Daryl Williams because in your in your mind when you think of Daryl Williams, you think of a big bruising guy not realizing that Daryl Williams this last season was one of the leaders in running back receptions. I think he was sixth, something like that, in running back receptions. And was a goal line back. It, that, he it, would take over a decent amount of the third down work yeah. immediately. He was a pretty good back. Um, but I, it almost feels like this James Conner season from last year because he wasn't – it was a lot like Najee. He wasn't impressive on a yards per carry – but uh, was was heavily involved, and this this would be the dream season for Najee is is put up the fifteen rushing touchdowns. You just need an offense that's much 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 better than we had last season. There's your top ten. Whew. Incredible! How was that number four? It was, was as it impressive worth the wait? as uh, you had said. I Mike. told you, uh, Austin Eckler. Not a surprise. <laughs> Brooksy, what do we got coming up next episode? More running back. Oh, no, yeah. gosh. More interesting names, too, right? We get to move on. We get through maybe 24, 25. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for today's show. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow the show, and we'll be back. We'll be debating some more players, and maybe we'll have a nickname for the guys. I was just going to say for Andy, Jason, and the ball boys, <laughs> goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.